All right. Um, welcome, and uh, I know this is going to be worth the wait. Uh, today we have Lonnie Dupre, and his list of accomplishments is way too long for me to say anything much about them right now, except that we are just thrilled to have this adventurer, explorer, mountain climber extraordinaire, Lonnie Dupre, to come talk to us today. Welcome, Lonnie. The delay there, uh, the weather, as you probably know, uh, I came from the North Shore, so we had a lot of trees down and the power was out. And had 22 foot waves hitting uh, Duluth this morning, so uh, it took out all the boardwalk there uh, by the uh, Canal Park. So, yeah. <laughs> We're lucky so, uh, you're here. That's completely late, so thank you. Um, I'm going to start out my pro uh, my program with uh, a little bit what I did uh, for my TED talk in uh, um, in Fargo uh, about two months ago, and um, it's called Life in the Middle of Nowhere. And when I look at this picture of the Earth, I mean, they, it tells me it tells me several things. One, how fortunate are we to be on this little blue marble in the middle of nowhere. And it also told me what a special place this is. And also what it told me was that I wasn't going to be complacent with my life, given this opportunity. Because what are the odds? Let's see if my clicker will work from here. Oh, oh no. Is it on? There you go. There we go. Um, so, I, uh, so growing, uh, when I first seen that picture of the Earth, I was eight years old, and that's when Neil Armstrong went to the moon. And for Neil Armstrong, it wasn't about getting to the moon first or beating the Russians there. It was about seeing things from a different perspective. For him, it was seeing Earth from space. That was the special. For me, I knew I wasn't going to be a, a, an astronaut. Uh, I, I really wasn't uh, interested in that, but I was interested in our planet. And growing up on a farm in central Minnesota, a little farm out of center, Centerville, Minnesota, um, uh, we worked the fields um, when I was uh, on a school break. And the summers were hot, and they were almost unbearable for uh, a little boy, and so I longed for winter. I longed for winter. <laughs> Things got cooler, and the snow came, and the lakes froze over, and the rivers froze over, and I could travel on these creeks and rivers, expanding the areas uh, that I could explore outside of the farm. Plus, I could stay cool. So when I was on the farm, and I, I thought, well, being in Minnesota, we always think Minnesota is as far as north goes, right? <laughs> but actually, I went on to discover that north goes another 2,000 miles north, and that there are people up there. Let's see if I get my clicker to work. Oh, must be just. There we go. Oh. Do we want to turn it? I'll go back just a little there. Oh. Oh. Right there. Anyways. <laughs> I went, uh, okay, I'm going to go back. This should work, yeah. There we go. I went on to discover that there are people living out there called Inuit people. And these people are living, you know, 2,000 miles north of Minnesota. How do they possibly stay warm? You know, how, what do they eat? How do they dress? Um, and so I went on uh, throughout school to learn everything I could about these people. Now these people are the polar Inuit, and they live like 700 miles from the North Pole. They still dress in polar, uh, polar bear pants, blue fox Cody taparkas, they still have seal skin boots, um, they still travel by dog team, and here we're setting a bunch of hooks uh, together with squid to bait to fish halibut, Greenland halibut through the ice. That for me, that led to 30 years of polar exploration. 
starting in 1989, uh, where we tr did a joint Soviet-American expedition across the Bering Sea to promote peace between the two superpowers. But also then I went on to do many other expeditions after that. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, to do some of these expeditions here. In 1991, in my, when in my late 20s, I did a 3,000 mile journey of the Northwest Passage by dog team with one other person. Uh, then I, I've been to the North Pole twice, pulling sleds uh, from Canada. Did the first ever and only circumnavigation in Greenland, all non-motorized by dog team and kayak. Um, been through Norway as part of the Winter Olympics in 1994, where we ran dogs through uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and into Russia. And then, um, and then uh, a couple other uh, expeditions that weren't on here, but another one that I did was the first solo winter ascent of Denali in January, mm -hmm. which I'll talk to you in a little bit. Um, so on the Northwest Passage, I was 27, 28 years old. Um, I hooked up with a friend of mine, Malcolm Vance. And we traveled from Churchill, Manitoba, in 1991, in October, or excuse, excuse me, uh, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, in 1991, in October. And then went all the way across the uh, Canadian far north, all the way to Churchill, Manitoba, finishing up there in April. It was uh, 3,000 miles. By dog team, we traveled to 13 Inuit villages along the way to understand um, a little bit about the Inuit culture that I've been studying for years to learn how their uh, culture may have changed over the last several years and what, what they've retained about their culture, what they have lost. Um, so on that trip, the cool part for me was um, not, uh, not just traveling from village to village, but actually getting in those villages and talking to the Inuit elders about the things that they've seen in their life, the things that they've done. Uh, are they still hunting? Do they still travel by dog team? They'd always give me advice with the route. Be careful to go over there. Don't go over there. There's lots of polar bears and so on and so forth. Oh, and uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, when I get back to uh, original slides there. There we go. So uh, visiting with uh, the Inuit elders and the children there. Um, so we got a lot of cool images of the uh, folks um, in all these different villages, like I mentioned, 13 of them. I don't know why the clicker's doing that, but... Oh, sorry about that, people. But uh, give you a little intro into the beginning, so let me see if I can go there. Okay, so then after the Northwest Passage expedition, I was so intrigued about the Arctic and the ice and the people that I wanted to go and try to go around Greenland. And for, for me, Greenland is a place where ice is born. This is where 85% of the Arctic Ocean sea, uh, sea ice comes down out of the Arctic Ocean, goes around the east coast and up the west coast of Greenland. And then this is where the majority of North America's icebergs are created. Mm. And so going to Greenland was just the, the it was, was my idea of the perfect place in the Arctic because it had the polar Inuit, it had the ice, it had polar bears. And, uh, and some of the icebergs, as you can see, are amazing. So if you can imagine kayaking next to all this, all this ice, uh, not to get too close because it can cap pieces of ice as big as a house that could squash your kayak. Um, uh, so you can see what intrigued me about Greenland. I mean, this, this kind of scene is around every corner around every corner. Oh, sorry about that. And there's a malfunction there. Oh. Uh, anyways, 
I'm going to go back just a little bit. So some of the other ice that we would see is uh, what's this called sun cupped ice. So this is freshwater ice that may have, been, may have been created from an inland lake up on the Greenland ice cap and then it slowly came out a glacier, ended up in the water and then it tosses and turns in the sea ice there in the, in the salt water and that in combination with the sun hit it create the sun cupped effect on freshwater, sea, on freshwater ice. So it's just those kind of things are just like, oh man, what's this? What's this? Around every corner, you're, you're seeing new things. Um, I'm going to jump right to this one. There's uh, So you can imagine why Greenland has never been circumnavigated before. Well, let's give you a good idea. The, the, the whole shoreline of Greenland, all the way around it, is usually plugged with drifting ice that came down from the Arctic Ocean and the North Pole area. And sometimes that plugged the entire coast, uh, completely compressed sea ice all the way out, maybe five miles all the way around. So it's kind of this big icy fence that protected Greenland for all those years of being circumnavigated. And one of the reasons John Holger, my partner from Australia, and I were able to get all the way around Greenland is that we were we were able to do it. We were not uh, we were able to do it because we could be amphibious. We could uh, put our boats, our canoes, or our kayaks into the water, paddle, and when we ran out of water to paddle in, we'd pull them up on the ice and drag them sometimes for miles, and then we would do that again. And we did. I mean, considering because Greenland's a long ways around, it's six thousand miles, right? <laughs> So, so you have to start when you're young. <laughs> you get around this thing. And so when we could get through that ice, sometimes I would jump up on an iceberg or jump up on Hans Rock like this, and I would look ahead and see um, where we could paddle, where we could wiggle through. And then we'd get back into the kayak, and I'd put that in my mental Rolodex, and we'd just kind of wiggle through there and jump up on a piece of ice again. Um, so you can see, uh, you can see my partner John here, we're pretty tired. Uh, we've been getting through this what we call brash ice for uh, several weeks now. We're getting really exhausted and uh, it just, you can show, see the exhaustion on John's face. Um, but we were, we were making head, headway even though it was a little bit at a time. Um, so sometimes we'd have to pull out on uh, uh, onto like a floating ice pan, look at the map again, again get up high to see where we needed to go. But you can kind of see, can you? It's so hard to imagine kayaking in that kind of condition. And so, but the highlight is we'd be sitting there uh, looking at the map and stuff like this, and all of a sudden two norwhales would just come up, like right in the water, right in that slicey uh, icy water, just come up and go down. It's like, whoa, that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, a typical camp on the east coast of Greenland. So this is an interesting picture because it shows a very active glacier behind me. And then it shows a multi-year iceberg that's been grounded uh, in the water there. And so it's been there several summers, you can tell, because it's getting grounded from summer melt. But very active. But this was the... Uh, the topography of the East Coast, rock and ice. Rock and ice, that was it. Um, after we were done kayaking, we uh, lived and traveled with the Polar Inuit. Um, we drove our dogs the very, the very same way they do theirs, and I've actually learned from them years ago. And uh, here we are just uh, collect, uh, catching some fish. These are Greenland halibut. These are the same food that we'll eat and the dogs eat, and uh, a lot of these will get put up and dried too for the winter months. Um, but again, still dressed in very traditional clothing, um, seal skin boots to be waterproof, polar bear pants because they're warm. Um, and uh, so, in in the northern in in in. The northern part of Greenland, all travel is done by dog teams. So, um, you know, we have a car in the driveway. They have 20 or 30 dogs, right? <laughs> and 
these ducks, they start out young, but they start out like, young like this. These guys are too young to be pulling sleds yet, but, but uh, this is uh, their uncles here. Uh, oh my God. These, uh, I, love this, I love this shot, they're almost twins in, in several ways there. <laughs> So those are, uh, those are our dogs, John and I's dogs. Uh, we traveled with 14 dogs and they all had, they all, all had various names, of course. Uh, a few of them would travel on one side uh, together, we called them the Oak Ridge Boys. And uh, Tom and Jerry and Caillou and Quick and yeah, they all had their names. But we traveled uh, 3,000 plus miles with these dogs around the north. Um, so every, after every couple hours, uh, two to three hours of traveling, I would rest the dogs. I would untangle their lines a little bit because all the dogs traveled on the same length of lines. They're all about 18 feet long. And so they, over the course of three hours, will weave the lines together hmm. a little bit and you can form this kind of knot. But it was pretty easy to untie. They just all lay down on command and I would just untangle those ropes and hook them back to the sled and away we would go. And that way, uh, so when dogs are traveling in the fan hitch, uh, it's very comfortable for them because they can travel anywhere they want, next to their uh, brothers and sisters, or next to a friend, or next to grandma and grandpa, or wherever they wanted to travel, uh, they could travel next to them, and they could pick their own footing. Um, so it was a very uh, cozy uh, travel environment for the dogs, and um, um, and it was more instinctual too because uh, the Inuit dogs are much like uh, wolves. They, they like to travel in packs. No. Every night, uh, John and I would uh, set up the camp, chop ice, melt it for drinking water and to, for melting water for cooking. And the dogs would be placed out in groups of five around the tent to, uh, as polar bear alarm clocks. So they would let us know by their squeaking at any particular time at night uh, that there's a bear coming in camp. So get out of your sleeping bags, <laughs> that kind of thing. Did that ever happen? Oh, um, let me go back one. Yeah, we had five polar bear encounters. I'll tell you about a couple of them later. But uh, inside the tent, so we, we've been on trail now for almost 90 days, three months, right? We haven't had a bath. No one knows whether we're alive or dead, and we're in the middle of, middle of northern Greenland, going around the coast. And this is back before internet, Facebook, satellite phones. It was even before cell phones, just before cell phones. So we communicated with this big green radio in the center of the tent. It's a single sideband radio telephone that uh, could communicate after we spread out a big huge antenna. Uh, we could communicate up to 600 miles. That was it. And 600 miles usually meant some remote scientific weather base in Greenland or in Arctic Canada that would pick up our signal and then relay that information back home to our families to let them know that we were still around. And uh, so those are the old days of uh, exploration. Um, this is Caillou, which means uh, brown in Inuktitut. Um, he's uh, just uh, on watch for polar bears there. Oh. Let me get back up a little bit here. I just want to get back to a couple. Yeah, they started. Okay, so then after Greenland, we went to on to, and I'll see if I, for some reason, this thing is double. I'll get back here. There we go. Um, okay, so then after Greenland, we showed you, we went all the way around Greenland here. Then I ended up, we ended up doing two expeditions to, to the North Pole from Canada. And what we are going to try to do is, uh, on our first expedition in 2006, is we're going to try to get to the North Pole in the summer months. That means we're going to leave in May and try to get to the North Pole sometime in July. 
uh, to bring attention to climate change and what's going on with the Arctic Ocean sea ice. Oh, I don't know why it keeps clicking all the way over there to that. So anyways, um, I'm just going to get one back one more here. You're getting to see more pictures than you care to look at. Anyways, we, uh, we started off from Ellesmere Island, Canada with 250 pound sleds. Now these sleds um, were really boats. They were whitewater canoes. Because we were going in the summertime to the North Pole, we would expect, we were expecting to reach, uh, get lots of open water. <laughs> where we're gonna have to paddle those whitewater canoes across. But um, they also needed to be first and foremost a good sled. So we picked these whitewater canoes that were specially designed out of Canada. We put plastic runners on the bottom. We loaded them up with all of our gear to last us for two months on the Arctic Ocean sea ice. And we left Ellesmere Island, the northernmost pot, Spartan uh, place in Canada that, on our way to the pole. So the kind of ice that you would experience on the North Pole is, is very pressured up very pressured up sea ice, blocks of ice that are sometimes 8, 10, 12 feet thick that are piled up to, in, into hills that are up to 50 feet high. And every once in a while you come across these bands of really broken ice and this gives you an idea of some of the ice uh, we encountered on our way to the pole. <laughs> so, sometimes we would uh, use little blocks of ice to get across these uh, open cracks, but sometimes we would have to push our sleds in spanning these cracks and then take a big running leap and jump them. And, uh, um, but sometimes we, we, the leads were so big, we actually couldn't uh, get across because the leads, the open leads would be sometimes up to a mile wide. Oh, and we would have to take the two canoes and we'd catamaran them together with our skis, spanning the gun walls with our skis, and then we'd tie them down and it created a catamaran platform <laughs> where we could paddle it across. Or if we couldn't paddle because the ice was, there was a little bit of ice, but we could break the ice, one of us would don a dry suit and swim. Oh. Oh. oh, sorry about that. For some reason, just, there we go. Let's see if I can get another one. There we go. They're swimming. So, you can see our, you can see the skis that span the gun walls. And uh, Eric and I, Eric who went on this expedition with me, Eric Larson, uh, we get to the edge of the lead and then we do the rock, paper, scissors thing. Right? Like, who got to go in? <laughs> I would always lose. I would lose that. And I'd jump in. And so you would have one, you'd have a rope tied to your ankle that's tied to the boat. And then you would swim across. And when you got to the other side, then you'd pull your partner and the boat. <laughs> now these dry suits are pretty interesting because they're like these big Gumby suits that you could just slip in with your ski gear on, bless your skis of course, and, uh, and then zip up, and then if you did the backstroke, uh, it was a much drier method than going forward because then if you went forward, you get water down your suit, so you just did the backstroke. So, is that, so you're doing backstroke in that picture? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, anyways, uh, so, <laughs> We had five polar bear uh, encounters on that expedition, and uh, I'll tell you about I'll tell you about one of them. Um, we've been on the Arctic Ocean for about three months, at uh, three weeks, excuse me, and um, I'm tired. Um, I just got into the tent. I'm pulled the sleep bag up around my neck, and I'm just ready to doze off. I'm dreaming about eating a steak or something. I can't quite remember. <laughs> And then all of a sudden I hear this boom. And I open up my eyes and the ceiling of the tent just pushed against my face. <laughs> and I knew exactly what it was. It's the only thing it could be, right? As a polar bear. So all we could do, two brave polar explorers, was scream. <laughs> so we screamed and the tent popped back to its original shape. <laughs> and we looked out the door and this bear is running through the ice away from the tent. <laughs> 
never to be seen again. <laughs> Needless to say, uh, Eric and I couldn't sleep very well for the next several days after that. Uh, luckily, the bear had come down on our pots and pans, uh, right in the vestibule area, and just tore the vestibule a little bit and dinged at us. But, um, so what polar bears typically do when they're hunting seals or whatever, Seals are living underneath the snow surface. They, they come up through the hole in the ice and they kind of sleep under the snow there. So the polar bears will sneak up on these seals and they'll get up with their hind legs and they'll jump up and they'll come down with all their weight on their two front paws, right down the snow, crushing the seal and then digging the seal out. That's what he did with their tent. <laughs> Let's see if I can. Yes, there we go. Um, so. I'm going to try to go back. I think it's going to... Yeah, it's, 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 this, this clicker is uh, good. I think I'm just a little far away from my... Would we be that better chart. if somebody operated from up there alive? Yeah, maybe. Well, well yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> this is good. This is good. I'll, I'm just going to spend a little more time on each picture. So what we did um, after our summer expedition to the pole, we reached the North Pole after 67 days, just the two of us. So we are pretty played out. And we coincide our pickup with a Russian icebreaker that was coming there at the same time. And we got picked up at the North Pole after 67 days. Got delivered back to Murmansk and then through Norway and then back home. That was in 2006. In 2009, I wanted to go back to the North Pole, only this time go in winter. Much different situations. Summertime, a little bit warmer. Summertime, when we left Canada, it was minus 20 Fahrenheit, fairly balmy. <laughs> we got to the North Pole on July 4th, during that summer one, it was plus 34. Ooh, ooh. Balmy, right? Winter, much different. 2009, we're leaving, we leave Ellesmere Island, the temperature is minus 58 below zero oh. on March 4th. Straight temperature. And we get all the way to the North Pole after two months. And the temperature, the warmest temperature temperature ever got was minus 23 Fahrenheit. Oh. Over six months, or over 60 days. So very different expedition, very grueling project. Um, it was so cold, matter of fact, that it, uh, just the uh, breathing would form icebergs on our eyelashes where the, our eyelashes wouldn't work anymore. So every now and then we had to stop, you know, put a warm palm on the eyes, get the icebergs thawed out and moved away, and then we could travel some more. But it was, uh, it was one of the coldest projects I've ever been in that was sustained like every day and it's so cold uh, it's hard to explain to people when it's 50 below zero out and you're living outdoors at 50 below zero on the arctic ocean plus there's a bit of humidity with 50 below is so difficult so there's no sitting down for 30 minutes to take a rest because you're pretty solid so the idea of having lunch or breaks while you're going to the north pole was jumping jacks while you're stopped, trying to eat an energy bar, trying to get a drink, you know, you're jumping around because you got to keep that body moving. And then at, the, at night when you get in the tent, you know, if it's 58 below zero outside, it's only 50 below inside. <laughs> so try it, when you get in your sleep bag at those temperatures, it's 45 minutes of kicking and screaming until you get enough heat generated in the sleep bag so you can fall asleep. So that was a really difficult, difficult project. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. Let's go back a little bit. Okay, so inside the tent, like I mentioned, it's only a slightly warmer. You just don't have to win, right? So it was these, it was this, these projects, the Greenland project, the Northwest Passage project, the North Pole projects, that really annealed me for going on to do one of the projects that I had just finished completing in 2015, which was a solo winter ascent of Denali in Alaska. Now, trying to do Denali in winter 
is probably every bit as tough as a North Pole in winter project, except for you've got altitude and you, you have a potentially chance of falling, because I'm doing this solo. So, um, but all these things that I've learned over the last 25 years has really annealed me for being able to do Denali uh, alone and in those temperatures, because to do Denali, which I'll try to bring to that next picture. Oops. I'm going to go back because I want you to see this, this mountains. So that's Denali. That picture was taken in January when I was at base camp. And so I'm at base camp. I'm at about 7,500 feet, something like that, taking a picture of Denali. So that's what I'm going to try to get up. And that mountain is about, uh, what, about uh, 10 miles away, maybe, maybe further, maybe, yeah, about 11 miles away, I guess. And so I got to work my way through crevasse fields and glaciers to get to that mountain and then climb climb that solo without without ropes or anything because <coughs> I'm going by myself. It doesn't do me any good to bring a rope. Oh, I'm so sorry about this, but you're getting anyway. So, um, so the only thing that's keeping me attached to the mountain, there are two ice axes. And these big pokey things on the bottom of my boots, uh, called uh, crampons. And these are the boots that I wore. And you can see the crampons there. They're 14 point crampons, stainless steel. The boot I have is two sizes bigger than I need for my feet because it's 60 below zero on Denali. So I need to be able to stay warm. And then I got a custom made over boot that goes over everything. So these boots are, also, unfortunately, very heavy as well. Uh, but um, uh, they kept us from getting frostbites because the biggest enemy for mountaineering is frostbite, either on hands or feet when you're, when you're moving. So as I climbed Denali, um, this is a shot taken from. 17,000, not about uh, 16,800 feet up on the mountain. All the other mountains behind me uh, were huge, humongous mountains, but now I'm above them. Um, I'm just traveling with a pack, two ice axes, my crampons, working this ridge. Oh, I want to go back because I want to show you this uh, part. It's important. Okay, so on the, on the expedition, I didn't, because of the winds and the extreme cold, I didn't use tents for my first three tries. I was on Denali for four winters trying to get up, up Denali. First three winters, I just stayed in snow caves. So at the end of each day of, of climbing, I would dig a, a, a snow shelter and then I'd put big snow blocks over the top of it. And, uh, and so that would keep me protected from the wind, 80 mile an hour winds, and it would protect me from the extreme cold. And uh, so at the end of the day, you know, because there's very limited light in, the, uh, in Alaska in the winter, maybe six hours of usable light, I would work my way up the mountain at the end of six or seven hours of traveling or climbing, I would then put my headlamp on and I would build my snow cave or snow shelter, and it would take me about two hours. So I'm exhausted, right? I get, I get to where I need to go, I'm exhausted, and now I gotta build a shelter. And it's like, oh, really? <laughs> you know? And, but the incentive is if I don't build a shelter and get in it, I'll be dead by morning, right? <laughs> so it's like, oh yeah, I better build one. So I, I, I spent two hours, got a really nice shelter, but the key to this technique is that on my way down from the mountain, I can use those shelters on the way out. Mm -hmm. So they're, uh, they, they're a way of, uh, uh, it's a place of refuge, a, a, a place of protection that I can go during a storm. How are we being able to mark those? So you can go down and fight them? Uh, well, all my, everything would be marked by bamboo wands. Oh, okay. Yeah. So inside the snow caves, you know, snug as a bug, 
Looking up at the ceiling, it was probably kind of cool, the light coming through, it looked like a turtle shell, kind of turned over. Um, I really uh, felt safe in my snow shelters. Even if it was blowing 80 miles an hour and the temperatures were 50 below outside, I felt really safe in my little snow shelter. So once I got in my snow shelters, if I had enough food and fuel, I could last until they ran out. But of course, carrying everything on your back up the mountain, you have limited amount of supplies. You can't stay in these places indefinitely. Oh, I'm going to go back because this is an important picture here. Oh, there we go. So um, on my last try in 2015, um, and because the snow is no good up high, I elected to bring a tent. And this tent is uh, made in Sweden. It's called the Hitlerberg. And I got this tent placed at 16,300 feet on the West Buckers Ridge. And so I'm, out, I'm working my way up the West Buckers Ridge towards the summit. I'm walking the West Buckers Ridge. To my right is 14,000 foot base camp, way down there, about 3,000 feet. In front of me is the uh, in front of me is 17,000 feet in a camp that I'm going to. Oh my God. <laughs> you can see the curvature of the earth from up there. Uh, so working my way down. Then I get up, uh, I'm real close to the summit here. And it was actually kind of balmy that day. It was 45 below zero. And for the summit, that was balmy. It was uh, January uh, 11th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm going to put on a little camera there to kind of document the, the, the ascent. The peaks in front of me. And Jace just came up from behind me there. You'll see a big thing. I just came up that uh, chute. Heading to the summit right there. So all those big mountains in the distance, which were all 14, 17,000 foot mountains, now look like little bumps in the horizon. And uh, at the very top of the summit is a little geodesic marker that is pounded into the rock up there. And. Uh, that was four years of trying and spending over a hundred days on the mountain over the course of four winters to get there. So I was a happy camper to be there. There was a lot of bowling going on at the summit. Uh, just glad to be alive. Although the most dangerous part of the expedition now is descending. Because it took trip. Right. <laughs> oh, <my. Yeah>, so, <laughs> so there was a lot of bowling going on that day. And uh, so I turned around. I spent only 15 minutes on the summit after four years of trying because I knew how dangerous it was to be there and started heading back down. My mom, let's see if I can get this to work. Let's see. Oh, I, I want to go back. <laughs> Let me go back just one here. See if I can make this happen. Oh, I guess I can't. Anyways, um, after uh, after Denali, after reaching the summit of Denali and getting down, I was thoroughly frozen. Right? I mean, I was like, I need to go somewhere warm. Right? <laughs> And I'm not a big fan of going to warm places, uh, but I uh, elected to go to Nepal. Oh my! Uh, to go to the Himalayas oh to do some climbing in the Himalayas. So I knew I would get into Nepal. It'd be nice and warm. I would thaw out from Denali, but then I would be up into the mountains again right away. Right. So um, it was really nice going to Nepal because it's just a completely different culture. It was some of the most amazing people I've ever met. 
um, that uh, Buddhist culture is just, uh, they're, they're, they're so pleasant. Um, so this is a typical village we go through that all, that have uh, pack horses that will give your supplies in the mountains or uh, sometimes as you get further up, you they would use yaks. Yaks can uh, endure the cold better. Um, oh, sorry about that. We'll get back here just a little bit. Um, so, as we got further into the Himalayas, we switched our gear over to yaks, and these are these kind of unruly, kind of shaggy cows. I don't know what else to say with big, sharp, pointy horns. And, but they could haul a bunch of gear, and they would wiggle their way through these mountain passes, and they're a lot like goats, you know, they're so sure-footed. They, they can go on these little skinny packs, uh, pathways with uh, maybe, uh, you know, 200 kilos of, of gear on their back. And so we would go our way up the mountain. Let's see if I can get ahead here just one. Oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna go back again because this is important. So um, the mountain we're attempting to climb is Kojiri. Kojiri is the same height as Denali, right? But a lot pointier. So we're going to the top of that pointy guy there. <laughs> It, it's so pointy at the top of that mountain that uh, the the four of us are, the four of us that were there we couldn't all get out of the top. <laughs> we had to stay down just a little bit, um, but that was our uh, the mountain Kojiri. There we are approaching the top of Kojiri. There. Uh, Team, uh, my friend Furbo behind me, he uh, lives up in the, in the Kumbu area of, the, of Nepal. Behind us, above um, Furba's ice axes, is uh, Everest. You can see Everest in the far left with the wind blowing off the summit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what the Himalayas look like uh, near Everest. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry about that. For some reason this is just... Okay, so then after Nepal, we went to an area in uh, British Columbia uh, to do a climb, and I hooked up with my partner, Pascal Marceau, a French gal uh, from Sudbury, Ontario, and we tried to make a first descent of a mountain there called Jeanette Peak. And uh, this is our last camp before uh, going up to the peak. And you can see our little, uh, little Hilbert tent there. Right below this camp we call Shark Fin, which is obvious. Uh, we reached uh, the summit. It's a fairly broad summit there, um, sponsored by Canadian Geographic Society. Um, and uh, it was our first known ascent of that mountain. It was uh, just on it, just above 10,000 feet. But this is uh, unusual. It's a very remote peak in uh, BC, uh, not far from Jasper, but no, one's, no one had ever been up it. So we, uh, we decided we uh, would try to wiggle into that place and see if we could see what that summit was all about and see what the um, conditions were like. And we actually made it to the summit after our second try. Um, but the cool thing about this whole expedition wasn't, for me, so much the summit, is that when we got back to our camp, a wolverine was in there. Uh, <laughs> so the wolverine got into our camp and it was digging around in there. And, uh, but it completely left uh, the dehydrated food. It didn't like the dehydrated food we had. <laughs> Probably figured it'd do a stomach ache or something, I don't know. But uh, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so then we went on to, to the Yukon to do some more climbing. This is up in the Yukon, Canada. We went to go climb a mountain called Mount Wood. And uh, it's uh, not too far from this peak here. This is Mount Steel. Our little tent down there. Beautiful terrain. Uh, really untouched. Very few people go here. And uh, we're working our way into that area. There we go. 
Uh, and then uh, we managed to make it to the top of Mount Wood, the first winter ascent. Uh, Mount Wood, it was 16,000 feet. Um, and Pascal's the first woman to make a winter ascent of a peak that high, high uh, and that close to the Arctic. So a very, very cold ascent of that mountain. We were happy to get down because there was a storm coming. Uh, we get back. Uh, we get back to camp. and stuff, but how do I find the time and the resources and stuff to do all these projects? And so for me, I, I look pretty simply. I don't have a lot of material things. Um, I don't, uh, I, I have a, uh, you know, I have a, a little Honda out here, but I have this little work truck. I don't have much. I build all my little cabins on this truck. Oh yeah, I'm still a farm boy. I got chickens. I'm transporting those to my friend's house. Those are our layers. We have a bunch of laying hens. Uh, but so, you know, I have a very, I, I also live in a um, really small place. Let's see if I can get this clicker. <coughs> oh, sorry. I'm going to go back. <coughs> we don't need to see that again. <laughs> so I live in, now I build these little block cabins that people can stand, and I'm, I'm really about. You know, less is more. You know, the more things we have, the more things we stay busy with, the, 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 the mortgages are bigger, the, the, you know, the maintenance is are more, all that kind of stuff. And so by, by living a little bit more frugally, or frugally with uh, less things, I, I've been able to free myself up both uh, financially and with time to go on and do these projects, these dreams. And I, and I met, and I'm saying, I, I visit with a lot of younger uh, the younger generation, a lot at schools and colleges, and I say it's not all about it's not all about money. It's about it's about pursuing your your life dreams. You know, if you want to be uh, an architect, or if you want to be an artist, or if you want to be whatever, a singer or whatever, pursue those dreams and do the best job you can at those. And if you spend enough time doing that, the financial rewards will come later. You know, they'll come later. Um, so, just to wrap it up, you know, this, with, with the earth and stuff, it's just like, the thing I've learned most about being here on earth is that this, this planet we live in is such a special place. And, it, and it's, but it's also very small and fragile. Um, so we really need to, uh, we, we, it's something we really need to take care of. It. We all have, we only have one Earth. We don't have any Planet B, if you've heard of that before. There's no Plan B. This is it. And so we want to be able to leave this Earth uh, in better shape than when we got here for our, for our children. And I think that's what we need to do. I think that's the most important thing. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now with any questions uh, you might have. And then I also have um, uh, a few books I brought here. Um, that I carry around the trees that have fallen in the road. <laughs> uh, I got the Life on Ice, uh, or excuse me, Alone at the Top. It's uh, my Denali climb. This is Life on Ice, 25 Years of Polar Exploration. Got some CDs and stuff like that. Some children's books in here as well. You have to sign those for anybody that may want one at the end. All right, any questions? Yeah. What's next? Uh, what's next? Uh, try to get back to Grand Marais without uh, any trees coming up. <laughs> no, no, um, uh, what's next? Uh, we are, uh, we've got two projects coming up. Uh, both are in Greenland. Uh, one is uh, to produce a film in Northwest Greenland about the polar Inuit and how their lives are shifting due to a warming <coughs> planet. 
because they rely on snow and ice, they rely on their dog sleds, they rely on snow and ice for hunting, uh, migration patterns of animals are changing because of the climate and because of the, the, just the earth warming and things changing. So we're going up there to talk to them and see how they're shifting their culture to make things uh, work for them. Um, and then we're going on a ski expedition on the east coast of Greenland to find this uh, old polar uh, explorer car that was left on a little rock in the middle of nowhere. We're going to ski in there and see if we can find this little kind of supply car with a note in it that no one has been to since 1934. Wow. We're going to go try and do that. So those are the two things we're going to do uh, fairly soon. Uh, any other questions? Yes? How do you stay hydrated on all these polar expeditions? How do you keep your water from freezing during the day? Or how do you yeah, how do we stay hydrated? Uh, on a North Pole expedition, we take a quart of fuel per person per day to melt, melt for melting water and putting into thermoses. Um, they have stainless steel thermoses on today that'll keep your water pretty hot till 30, for 30 hours or so, so even in extreme cold temperatures. So. So that's good. Um, and on mountaineering trips, we take about a 10 ounces of fuel per person per day uh, to stay hydrated, because hydration is the biggest thing for on these, for these projects. Yes? Um, this is an interesting question. That's when you were going on Greenland. Yes. Everything looks the same. And you didn't have GPS then. Right. <laughs> right, right. How did we navigate in Greenland when we were going around it? We just kept it on our right side. <laughs> but no, 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 I can't. I'm too easy. We, uh, <laughs> it, it's easy. It is so huge, right? So when we were navigating in Greenland, um, it's um, a lot of the coastal areas are fogged in. So it was, uh, so we, um, um, that right at that point, GPS was available, but it was uh, very rudimentary, it was very new at that time. And so even though we didn't use it for navigating, we used it at camp each day to know exactly where we were. And then the whole day was spent navigating with compass. So we navigated with compass. On the North Pole, the same thing. We just used the GPS in the tent at the end of each day. And then we traveled by compass and or whatever the sun was doing at what time it was during the day and what line of longitude we were traveling on would tell us which way we needed to go as well. So um, every, uh, it was all a little bit different uh, for each place. Uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah, way in the back there. Uh, you maybe said this, but how high is the summit of uh, Denali? Uh, the summit of Denali is, uh, I believe it's uh, 20,340 feet. But it's been corrected, and I can't remember if it's been corrected up or down. So you didn't need oxygen? No, I didn't take oxygen on Denali. I uh, acclimated uh, uh, very precisely on my way up there. I never climbed more than, if I was going to be climbing up and staying, I really never climbed more than 1,500 feet up. Uh, but it, you can climb up to three, 4,000 feet, but you just can't stay up there. So you can climb up 1,500 feet at a crack, if you're staying, or you can climb three or four thousand feet, but you have to come back down. If that makes any sense. So on summit day, I went up three thousand feet from seventeen thousand feet, take the summit, came back down to seventeen thousand. That was a thirteen-hour day with under headlamp. Uh, the beginning was under headlamp, and the end was under headlamp as well. Uh, yeah, one more. Yeah, another question. Oh, uh, you've got excellent pictures. What do you use for photographic equipment that's light enough and still gives you great shots? Yeah, photographic equipment. So I actually was a photographer back when there was film, right? When we used film. So I used Kodachrome 64 and there'll be a 50 slide film. That's what I used in all of my Greenland project. And I used it with a Nikon FM2 with just a Zeiss lens, 50 mil Zeiss lens. That's all I used in Greenland. Um, once I went to digital, I kind of gave up uh, uh, shooting uh, pictures, although I did take some cameras with me that managed to get a few of the other shots that you've seen that weren't Greenland. Um, and those were uh, uh, um, a robust 
Canon product called a G15 uh, Instamatic camera. That's what I used on that. Now I'm going back into digital a little bit um, because I guess photography, and uh, I've gotten over my uh, it's digital. You know, I like shooting film, you know. But uh, so I'm going back to uh, shooting uh, film here. Yes. My question is this: Are Jeremy on a trip? such as what you have experienced, what kind of food did you take with you or to keep up your energy? Ah, good question. What kind of food did I take to uh, keep up my energy? So we, we take a couple of things that we make at home. Most of our food we make at home, but uh, one of the key ones is our energy bar. So it's not really an energy bar. It's kind of a, well, yeah, it's kind of a, a block, more or less. Uh, it's basically uh, nut butters. It's nut butters mixed with uh, uh, raw honey, um, uh, powdered milk, and oatmeal, and it's all rolled together into one. So the reason why we, uh, the only sugar we use is raw honey, because uh, raw raw honey of all the sugars is the slowest burning sugar. <coughs> we want a sugar that's not going to spike us uh, like regular uh, regular cane sugar. We want a sugar that's going to sustain us uh, over a longer period. Plus, there's some trace mineral, minerals in honey that's good for us. The other thing that we make is our own our own beef jerky, basically. Uh, it's just it's very simple. Uh, it's just uh, eighth inch cut uh, beef uh, with uh, that's soaked in uh, soy not soy sauce but a Bragg soy sauce. It's kind of organic soy sauce with maple syrup. So it's maple syrups and Bragg's. Uh, soy sauce and that's it and then uh, we put it in the oven and dry it mm -hmm. um, oh. so those are two main main things that we take with us there's a lot of other things uh, most most of our stuff is like refried beans uh, lentils dried lentils those kind of things but most of the meals that we have almost all of them uh, can be done with just over hot water so there's not a lot of cooking a lot of cooking burns a lot of fuel fuel is heavy so a lot of our stuff is just one pot meals that can be uh, cooked with just boiled water um, and then covered and let's sit to hydrate. Uh, yes, one more question. Do they have, I think it's called chill burn, geothermal? Yeah, geothermal. Like Iceland? Yeah. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's only a couple spots in Greenland that has geothermal heat. Uh, it's in the very southern tip of Greenland, like like Iceland, uh, but I don't know if they've done a very good job of tapping that yet. Um, it's been 20 years since they've been there, so uh, they could have by now. But uh, they've got uh, they do have some geothermal on the southern part. Yes. Do you have any kind of birds that you saw? Not way up high, I'm sure, but, but on, on your travels. Uh, yeah, bird. North Pole uh, birds. Um, yeah, North Pole. We've seen a cool bird called a uh, ivory gull. Seen an ivory gull on the ice. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, ravens as high as uh, 17,000 feet uh, on Denali. Um, um, I've seen ravens all the way around Greenland, except for the extreme north. Um, trying to think of any other real cool uh, birds that we might have seen. Um, of course, lob snowy owls uh, on our Arctic trips. Um, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, for the Extended periods of time. How did you keep your spirits up? Uh, how did I keep my spirits up? Um, well, um, I always look at it um, like this is what I do, and, and it's uh, one foot in front of the other, and not try to look at the Arctic Ocean. Like when you're looking at the Arctic Ocean, you step onto an Arctic Ocean that's one and a half times bigger than the United States, right? And it plunges to a depth of 14,000 feet deep. And you're stepping onto that ocean, you're going, Try not to think of this. Right? <laughs> you just this is just put my put one foot in front of the other one day after another. Yeah. There was one there's a question way in the back there. Yeah. Yeah. I lifted you one of your boots, not both. I'm not sure I could summit the L and M Fleet Farm in town with them on. <laughs> uh, what is it what do you do to condition yourself prior to your climb? Physically yeah, condition. We condition ourselves. In the in the old days when we were young, we just did it. Right? <laughs> but now it takes months of uh, 
uh, for, a, for a mountaineering trip like Denali, and usually it's uh, five to uh, three to five months, depending, to train for it. Uh, sometimes uh, a little longer. Um, North Pole trip, same. You're pulling boat, uh, 250 pound boats for day in and day out for a couple of months. So yeah, it requires some, some exercise. So what we do is, I do a lot of backpacking with uh, some weights. I'll start out with maybe just 10 or 15 pounds and, and increase it up to 25 pounds. I try not to train with more than a quarter or a third of my body weight to a quarter of my body weight. Um, because I believe people can overtrain too. And if you want your joints to go the long haul uh, into your, you know, into your 70s and 80s and beyond, uh, you can't be overtraining uh, for everything that you're doing. Uh, because, um, yeah. And I'm in it for the long haul, so yes. What do you use for fuel for like melting your snow and so on? Yeah, what do we use for fuel? We use, it's called uh, Coleman fuel. Everybody's pretty familiar with Coleman fuel. It's white gas. In Europe, it's called naphtha. In uh, Denmark, it's called rinse benzene. You know, there's many names for it, uh, but uh, it's white gas. That's uh, the most uh, VTUs, uh, and it's uh, readily available. Um, so, what, last, uh, last uh, question, yes. Oh yeah, close calls. Um, I have, I've had, a, I've had a few, but um, probably the one that made me go home, you know, after, um, is I was uh, trying to do a winter solo ascent of Hunter in the Alaska Range right after Denali, and right out of camp. I was going up this uh, steep piece of rock, and I couldn't get up the rock, and so I laid down, back down towards my camp, and then I started walking to camp, but I didn't go the same way I went up, and I fell into a crevasse. Oh, Lord. And um, as I was falling into the crevasse, luckily I had my ice axe in this hand, the shaft of it, and I was hanging onto the head of it. And as I was falling down, the, the crevasse was on a steep slope. And it's quite wide, um, just cover, covered over by a wafer thin sheet of snow. And I went through, and as I was going down, I had my ice axe in this hand, and the shaft, the handle, I buried in the downhill side of the crevasse. And so I'm hanging in the crevasse, but I got my ice axe outside of the hole, stuck into the side of the, the crevasse. And um, so I just like was really still because I, I wanted to feel what the crevasse was like. I wanted to feel with my feet how big it was. And I couldn't feel anything in front of me, and I couldn't feel any walls of the crevasse behind me. So I knew it was big. And so I, uh, 